This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. Even while science is frequently thought of as an objective, rigorous study, it also involves creativity. Throughout history, the motivating force behind scientific discovery has been imagination. Let me now talk about some of the ways that science has been impacted by imagination. Scientists may first and foremost imagine new possibilities thanks to their creativity. What if questions enable scientists to develop hypotheses and design original research? According to Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. He was making the argument that innovation in science depends on the capacity to imagine new ideas. Second, creativity can assist scientists in visualizing complicated events. Consider the area of theoretical physics as an illustration. It would be challenging for scientists to comprehend and build the theories that underlie our understanding of the world if they were unable to visualize the structure and behavior of atoms, particles, and other tiny phenomena. Additionally, imagination is essential for conveying scientific concepts. Scientists frequently use analogies and metaphors which call for ingenuity and imagination to simplify complex topics for a larger audience. Think of the Big Bang Theory, for instance, which describes the beginning of the universe as an explosion. The use of imagination in research does not, however, come without risks. It can generate innovative ideas, but it can also result in erroneous assumptions and misunderstandings. Therefore, it is crucial that scientists maintain a harmonious balance between creative thought and impartial evidence-based research. After all, rather than replacing scientific knowledge, imagination's ultimate power rests in its capacity to enhance it. Let's now examine some well-known instances of scientific creativity. The identification of the DNA structure is one of the most well-known examples. Playing with physical models inspired James Watson and Francis Crick to envision the double helix's shape, which ultimately resulted in their important research. Isaac Newton's theory of gravity is an additional noteworthy illustration. According to legend, he assumed that the force that caused an apple to fall toward Earth from a tree would also affect the moon's orbit. His groundbreaking theory of gravity was created in response to this realization. To sum up, creativity is a crucial element of scientific discovery. Imagination drives creativity and increases our understanding of the world around us by enabling scientists to see new possibilities, comprehend different events, and effectively express their ideas. But it's critical to be aware of its possible dangers and create a balance between creative problem solving and evidence-based research. What is the main idea of the lecture? In which of the following situations is imagination most helpful in a scientific process?
Which of the following statements best describes the professor's attitude toward the potential pitfalls of imagination in science? What did the professor mean when they said? After all, rather than replacing scientific knowledge, imagination's ultimate power rests in its capacity to enhance it. Which example of scientific discovery does the professor imply was heavily influenced by imagination? Why does the professor mention both the Big Bang Theory and Isaac Newton's conception of gravity? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hello, Professor Smith. I'm considering taking your advanced computer science course next semester, but I'm not sure if I meet the prerequisites. Could you tell me what they are? Of course. To enroll in my advanced computer science course, you should have completed both an introductory programming course and a course on data structures and algorithms. I see. I've taken the introductory programming course, but I haven't taken a course on data structures and algorithms yet. Well, you might still be able to take the course if you have a strong understanding of the material from your previous coursework and a willingness to work hard. I do have experience programming outside of class, and I'm highly motivated, but I'm worried about falling behind without the formal education in data structures and algorithms. The course does assume a solid foundation in those areas. However, I've seen students with strong programming backgrounds and motivation succeed without having taken the prerequisite courses. That's encouraging to hear. Is there any additional material or resources you'd recommend I review before the semester starts? Yes, there are a few textbooks and online resources that could help you brush up on data structures and algorithms. I can send you a list if you're interested. That would be great. Thank you. I'll do my best to prepare before the course begins. No problem. Just make sure you let me know if you need any further guidance. Good luck! What is the main idea of the dialogue?
What does the professor imply about students who haven't taken the prerequisite courses? What resources does the professor suggest the student use to prepare for the course? How does the student feel about their background in data structures and algorithms? What is the professor's attitude towards the student's concerns? Now listen to the lecture. Ancient civilizations like the Mesopotamians, Egyptians, and Greeks serve as our starting point. They were the first people to observe the stars, utilizing basic instruments and astute observations to comprehend the patterns in the heavens. With astronomers like Hipparchus, who produced the first thorough star catalog, and Aristarchus, who suggested a heliocentric model of the cosmos, the ancient Greeks, in particular, made enormous contributions. In the Middle Ages, some of the finest astrological thinkers rose to prominence. These researchers improved the Greek astronomy heritage, making important improvements to observational methods and revising older models. They created the foundation for Europe's scientific revolution. Astronomy did certainly re-emerge during the Renaissance. Polish scientist Nicholas Copernicus created a model of the universe that put the sun, not earth, at its center. Though first opposed, the writings of Galileo Galilei and Johannes Kepler subsequently came out in favor of the heliocentric hypothesis. We were able to push the limits of our understanding even further in the 20th century as a result of the development of modern technologies. The Big Bang Theory was developed as a result of Edwin Hubble's findings that demonstrated the cosmos was expanding. The Hubble Space Telescope's 1990 launch changed the game by enabling humans to see the far reaches of the universe with unmatched clarity. As we look back, it is evident that each period built on the scientific advancements made in the one before it. But just as important as astronomy's past is its present. We are on the verge of interstellar travel and the probable discovery of extraterrestrial life, thanks to our unrelenting search for understanding. Finally, it's critical to keep in mind that astronomy encompasses more than simply telescopes, celestial objects, and challenging mathematics. It is about our position in the cosmos and our attempt to comprehend it. Let's remember the trailblazers who paved the way as we continue to push the envelope. What is the main idea of the lecture?
according to the lecture, who proposed a heliocentric model in ancient Greece. How does the professor feel when discussing the future of astronomy? What did the professor imply when he said? But just as important as astronomy's past is its present. Why does the professor say? As we look back, it is evident that each period built on the scientific advancements made in the one before it. Which of the following are discussed as part of the history of astronomy and which are not? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I'm trying to apply for jobs, but I'm not sure how to articulate my academic experiences as marketable skills. Can you help me? Absolutely. The key is to identify how your academic experiences have provided you with valuable skills. What was your major? I majored in English literature. Great. You likely have strong analytical thinking and communication skills from studying literature. You've probably also developed good research skills. That's true, but how do I present these skills in a job application? First, be specific. Use examples of projects, essays, or presentations where you used these skills. For instance, you might discuss a research paper you wrote, highlighting your analytical thinking, research, and communication skills. I see, that makes sense, but what about team skills? I mostly worked alone. Remember, group projects or any seminar classes? Those usually involve teamwork. Moreover, academic debates and discussions also showcase your collaborative skills. Yeah, I participated in seminars and debates. I just didn't consider those as teamwork. Exactly. We often overlook the skills we gain in the academic setting. By reframing these experiences, you can demonstrate a wide range of marketable skills. That's insightful. Thanks. I feel more prepared now. Glad to help. You're more skilled than you might think. What is the main purpose of this dialogue?
What does the counselor imply when they say? You're more skilled than you might think. How does the student feel about their skills at the end of the dialogue? What can be inferred about the counselor's attitude towards the student's ability to translate their academic experiences into marketable skills? What does the counselor suggest as a way to demonstrate analytical thinking and communication skills? Now listen to the lecture. A special way for people to express themselves is through the art of theater, where the stories of the world are shared, emotions are shown, and society are depicted. In the theater, the playwright and the script come first. Any theatrical production must have this at its base. The playwright utilizes language to describe situations, develop characters, and present a narrative. The director, the actors, and the creative team then use these words as their guide. The function of a director is crucial right now. The director directs the production from auditions to the final performance, interpreting the playwright's work. The play is shaped by the director's vision, which transforms the written script into a dynamic, engaging performance. The actors are the heart and soul of the theater. They give the characters personality and allow the spectator to feel their feelings. Through their performances, they establish a bond and foster empathy, which enables the viewer to journey together with the characters. The set design, lighting, costumes, and sound are only a few of the technical elements that greatly influence the theatrical experience. These components contribute to the play's atmosphere and mood, drawing the audience into its universe. Don't lose sight of the fact, though, that theater also portrays society, giving voice to the voiceless and questioning our perceptions. It frequently reflects the successes and failures of its day. This feature of play frequently inspires and greatly moves me. Theater is a different sort of entertainment from movies and television, despite their popularity nowadays. Both media offer narrative-driven experiences, but theater stands out as a particular art form due to its intimacy and immediateness, as well as the fact that it takes place in front of a live audience. Last but not least, although unrelated to theater, some people mistakenly believe that street performances and flash mobs are a sort of theater. They do have some similarities, such as live performances, but lack the dramatic structure and meticulous rehearsing that characterize theater. Theater is a comprehensive and complex medium for expressing oneself, 
Few other art forms can compare to the unique combination of storytelling, visual artistry, and human connection it delivers. What is the main idea of the lecture? According to the lecture, what is not part of theater? How does the professor feel about theater as a reflection of society? What does the professor mean when she says? Theater is a comprehensive and complex medium for expressing oneself. What is the professor implying when the immediacy and intimacy of theater is discussed? Why does the professor say? Theater stands out as a particular art form due to its intimacy and immediateness, as well as the fact that it takes place in front of a live audience. 